Welcome to Restaurant Influencers. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue Media. This episode is brought to you by Yelp and by Entrepreneur Magazine. We are fortunate uh, to interview the best of the best in the restaurant industry. Um, this rest- this podcast is called Restaurant Influencers, and in life and in the restaurant business, we learn through lessons and stories. Today's guest is Philip Camino of Camino Industries. Philip, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. Good to see you again, man. Yeah, it's uh, for those of you that have been listening to the podcast, we're so fortunate um, in this year, 2022, to have the tools the, the technology, the ability to connect with people that are truly doing some remarkable things. And a fellow friend of ours, Josh Kopel, who is also a podcaster, a full comp podcast, he connected you and I. Um, we've already done this interview. This is the second interview, yeah. um, but we're happy to have you back and happy to have you share share your story. So I'm, I'm going to open it up with where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage or venue? Oh, uh, good question. Favorite stadium? Hmm. I mean, there's a few. I got to be honest, the best stadium I've been to in the last year is probably Allegiant in Vegas. Okay. The Raiders' new home. Um, yeah. SoFi is pretty great, too, if you haven't been to SoFi yet in LA. Both pretty amazing brand new facilities uh, on the West Coast of America. Um, yeah, just like when you go into that place in Vegas, there's just so much, uh, frenetic energy, even though it's a team that moved recently to Vegas from, as everyone knows, Oakland and previous to that was in LA. Um, the fan base is there. Um, there's a little bit of like kind of a home and away thing happening because you get people who are traveling in to see the opposition. So there's like this kind of duality and you also get that in LA too. when you see see the chargers or the Rams play and you saw that in San Diego too. And the chargers were down there. It's like, there was a lot of people that flew in for those games or traveled to those games from other cities. Um, but just an ardent fan base already in Vegas and just really loud, like probably the loudest stadium I've ever been in. Um, it was unbelievably loud in there and it's enclosed and you've just got these people who are going crazy. And if you know, football, you know, Raiders fans are pretty much the wildest out there. Uh, so yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I went and saw, I'm a Dolphins fan and I went and saw the Dolphins play the uh, Raiders this past year. Very cool. Uh, that was awesome. So, so let's uh, let's go to Allegiant Stadium. Let's pretend I get a Entrepreneur Magazine, Yelp, Toast. I get them all together and say, let's put on a hospitality conference, one that doesn't suck, one that we actually all want to go to. That's <laughs> filled filled with raving hospitality professionals, restaurant professionals, people that truly care about their craft and care about taking care of people. And I I put you uh, on on center stage and give you the mic and give you two minutes to tell your story. Can you do that for us? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, for sure. Well, hospitality wise, uh, started way back in 2008 when I moved to LA. Um, I was living on the East Coast previous to that and had a career in entertainment and also a little bit of a career in uh, the technology business. Um, but really, hospitality was in my veins. When I was in college, I was the director of finance and operations for my student union. And that's really where I kind of cut my teeth on hospitality restaurants, bars, I basically ran all of the on-campus food service and nightclubs and kind of restaurants and everything that was happening on campus from a hospitality perspective and sort of fell in love with it at that point, detoured my career into, like I said, um, entertainment and technology, but then that never really leaves you. Like when you've got that background and that's really what you love, um, you kind of find your way back to it. So when I moved to LA in 2008, Um, there was a couple of opportunities that presented themselves and, um, me and a couple of partners ended up opening this restaurant in, um, West Hollywood called the Hudson. And quite literally, it's shocking that it did well because we knew nothing about anything, especially operating in a major market like LA and, um, yeah, it opened. We just had the advantage of having an amazing location, um, kind of right smack dab in the middle on a corner lot of West Hollywood and you know, everyone saw it and everyone knew it. And, um, it was really hot restaurant for like five years. Um, it wasn't as hot the second five years, I actually still have the building and the location and I'm, I just tore it down, but I'm remodeling it and we're going to reopen it probably early 2023 as a new concept, but it's one of the best locations in LA 
Um, but after, you know, 2015 or so, um, some more stuff kind of popped up around to some competitors and that really diminished like the quality of what we were able to deliver in terms of revenue uh, to our investors. And we just, we just weren't as successful. So pandemic hit, long story short, remodel, rebuild, relaunch um, later this year into next year for that project. Um, but like, like I was saying the first time around in this one, like once you have one that works and we had one that really worked for years and our investors were really happy and everyone made money and was paid back really quickly, it really affords you the opportunity to jump into other projects. And so we opened another restaurant with the same group that was successful on third street called the Churchill had that for seven or eight years. Um, and at the same time, I just started expanding. I started my company, um, signed a couple of pretty big leases. I, I took over the building in uh, Westwood Village, which would eventually become um, my sort of flagship restaurant fellow. I've had that for close to five years now. And, you know, just, just got Michelin rated. And, you know, we're starting to really kind of gain accolades as like one of the better fine dining restaurants in LA. And that's really been my focus really over the last couple of years is just sort of um, building from our initial you know, um, restaurants and, and locations here in LA that were probably a little bit more nightlife focused and a little bit more focused on like the bar, a little less focused on cuisine, a little less focused on experience. And I think when you start, you don't really know any better. So you, you know, you sort of take that route, you just take the route, okay, what's going to drive the most revenue and how are we going to make the most money? But as you get older and your tastes refine and you sort of learn a little bit more, you can, do things that are a little bit more difficult, I would argue. Um, and that for me has been fine dining and really kind of like chasing, um, you know, accolades and things like Michelin and things like Le and Chateau and really kind of going after those types of things and bringing in chefs that are at that level and sommeliers who are at that level and bar directors who are at that level and, you know, trying to do it at a really premium level. And that's really what my, uh, what my company's built around now is how do we, how do we sort of strive for excellence every day? What are the tools? What are the things that we need to put into the business every day um, in order for us to be excellent, in order for us to you know, achieve at a world-class level every single day? Um, and LA, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the culture is not built around fine dining, really. It's not really a, a market like New York or Chicago or even San Francisco where there's like this embedded uh, dynamic fine dining culture, right? Where like chefs are well-known, people go to openings with the intent of eating great food, not because of who's going to be there. Um, they're really, really focused on the actual food and the experience of fine dining. And there's a, you know, there's a really, really nice culture around it in those other markets. LA's not that far behind, but it just hasn't been as developed and it's never really been a part of the fabric of this city. It's always been a very casual dining market. And so we're trying to change that a little bit, but it also gives me an advantage being a younger operator um, where you don't have to play as much catch up because there's not that many people who are that far ahead of you, right? Like we can jump into the game and I have jumped into the game in the last couple of years and we've pretty much caught up to everyone else who's, who was ahead of us at the time. So, so yeah, and in, in a nutshell, man, we're striving to do things that, um, I feel are world-class and we're striving to be excellent. And that's really like the ethos of the company is like doing the right things every day, showing up, you know, making sure that the restaurants and the experience for our guests is world-class. And, you know, for us at that, if, if we do that, if we have guests that leave the restaurants every single day and they're like, wow, that was an experience that I've never had before. And I'm going to hold that with me for a period of time after this day, that's a win for us. And, you know, we, we sort of strive to, to, to accomplish that goal day in, day out. So one of my favorite quotes uh, comes from Cal Newport's book, Be So Good They Can't Ignore You, which is a right. Steve Martin quote. Uh, one of the things why we're so happy to put on this podcast is we get to connect with incredible operators, incredible visionaries all over the globe and um, understanding really what influence is. You know, sometimes it's social influence, sometimes it's in real life influence, sometimes it's the craft, you know, understanding yeah. that if you are so good, then the accolades will come. Um, for you, it sounds like there is a bit of reverse engineering what goes into getting those accolades. Mm -hmm. And can you can you talk us through your process of of how did that come to be? Did it happen organically, or did you actually, you know, figure out, you know, we need to do this, this, and this. We need to hire this person who's the best at X 
in order to move this vision along. Yeah. So I, I mean, kind of by design, like I, I took this and fellow was really the precursor and the the beginning of the thought process for me around what's it going to take to make this restaurant that is 7,000 square feet. It's a hundred years old. It's historically protected. It's this beautiful uh, building from the 1920s. Um, but no one knew about it and no one knew that it was there. And it's in this like weird pocket of LA that's close to UCLA, but it's not a really a, a hospitality or a restaurant haven. It's not where people go to eat. Um, but the building itself was so special that I couldn't ignore how it looked, how it felt, the capabilities that it had. And so for that reason, I jumped into that deal and I said, look, I'm going to make this work one way or the other. And a couple of years in, I kind of figured out that we were in a, in a place that isn't for a reason, isn't um, highly trafficked um, as a restaurant destination. And the way for us to kind of put this place on the map and the way for us to really kind of drive traffic from all over LA and hopefully outside of LA and in the state and hopefully eventually the country was to go after these things and put in a team that is so good that you wouldn't be able to ignore it, right? Much along you know the lines of the book that you just referenced. So how do you like create this thing that doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter if you're in Westwood Village, it doesn't matter if you're in Valencia or San Diego for that matter. If you make it great, people are going to find it. And um, the, the sort of the, the thing for me that jumped out was when the Michelin Guide came out in 2019 and you had these, these two restaurants in uh, like really in the middle of nowhere kind of in LA in terms of des- in terms of dining destinations and Naka and Vespertine, they both earned two Michelin stars and they're, re- they're in Culver city. They're in this place called Palms, which is like, really no one goes there. Uh, yeah. to eat. And so it kind of showed me that it didn't really matter where you were. Like it wasn't about an address. It was more about the quality of the product. And if you deliver that, if you put the right team in place, and you put the right chef in and you coach up that team and you get it to that level and then you capitalize it properly. Um, you know, anything can happen in any location. And so that was the big eye opener for me. It was really the Michelin guide 2019 LA, the year that the guide came back. And, um, I started strategizing from the time that guide came out about how to build a team that would be able to deliver that type of experience. I started looking at sommeliers. I started looking at chefs. Um, the pandemic was actually, in a weird way, very helpful uh, for us in that regard, because there was an access to talent during that time that uh, really wasn't available before the pandemic. Like if you talk to me in January of 2020, all the people that I end up employing today were gainfully employed in other places, making great money and they were super happy, right? But then four months later, the majority of those restaurants aren't open, people are on the street. And I was fortunate enough that we had gone through a capital raise quite literally days before uh the pandemic started like early march and i was just going yeah it was like super serendipitous it wasn't even by design and i'd love to say it was but it just wasn't we had been raising money anyway and a deal just happened to close like literally a week before i think it was like march 7th or something that wow you know close and funded and uh, i remember it was funny i was remember sitting with the investors and um this like everything was starting to kind of percolate but it was still no one knew because it wasn't state of emergency yet and it wasn't like 10 if it had been 10 days later i think the deal wouldn't have got done and i remember him signing and going like he's like i'm not really sure if this is a good idea or not but okay let's do it anyway right and he just rolled the dice and he's for that reason still with me and you know we have an amazing relationship and he he kind of like you know bet the farm on me in a period of time where he probably shouldn't have um but i think for for taking that risk and um, and writing that check, um, it, it really allowed us to be more flexible it, during the pandemic when it came to like talent acquisition. You know, we re- remodeled the buildings. We really kind of used that time that we had, that downtime that we had during the pandemic to our advantage to like make the buildings look great, bring them up to a world class level. And then, you know, the last piece, which is all important, is just bring the right people on board. Yeah. Uh, so there are not many restaurant owners on earth that are crazy enough to podcast. Um, you're one one of them. 
I would sure. love to, I would love to hear your experiences with launching the Happy Mouth podcast, which you can find at Yelp for restaurants. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it when I was listening. But uh, what, what, what did you learn by by launching that podcast? Yeah, it was it was a great experience. And, and the, the plan, to be honest with you, is to keep going. Um, we got 80 episodes in uh, my partner on the podcast, Naisha Arrington, who's this incredible chef and friend and colleague and just an awesome human being. Um, and I collaborated on that with Yelp, as you mentioned, and Josh kind of helped get that started for us as well. Um, just an, just a good experience. It was like, it was very interesting to, I don't know if there was a great in that season, the way that we concepted it, I don't know if there was a great product market fit. Um, we sort of kept going down this path of um, daily podcast, you know, 10 to 20 minutes type thing. Um, well, well produced, well stylized, but kind of picking a different topic every day of something that was going on in hospitality or something that was going on in the world that might impact hospitality um, in a certain way. And um, we ended up, like I said, doing 80 episodes in that format. Um, I think it connected with like a really solid group of hospitality people and people that knew about it really liked it. Um, I, I think the challenge with it is, is like, and you can speak to this, is guests are such an important part of podcasts because not only do you sort of insert differing opinions and conversation that are different than just you and a co-host bantering back and forth every yep. day, um, that can be a little bit limiting because like once you've gone through your opinions and the audience kind of knows who you are and what you're going to say and how you're going to respond to things, it loses a little bit of impact and guests can drive so much, not only from like a, a driving the content and making it a bit more interesting conversationally, but also from a marketing reach, they just help you get it out there to many more people. And that was, I think the one aspect that we maybe didn't have, we had a few guests, but I do feel like guests and guesting on podcasts is such an important part of the formula. Yeah, I yeah, think really the the, the conversational, you know, the the idea of having a, a talk show where you're giving somebody literally a seat at the table between two right. people that are diving into a subject that you care about. I mean, the intimacy of the audio storytelling, even if you're watching on video for YouTube. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I look forward to see what you uh, what, what the, the next version is, because I think it is important. Um, anybody that's listening to this podcast, if you're listening to this podcast, I mean, literally, we we believe the same that you need to have a mobile first website, you need to figure out a way to storytell online. And one of the things that I appreciate what you do and what your entire team does is you do a great job talking about the brand, you do a great job of conveying the hospitality of your restaurants online. Do you guys have a strategy that you use for your for your, your digital storytelling? So, I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about um, a lot internally is just authenticity. I mean, really making it so that you're not just posting for the sake of posting or you're not just snapping a photo for the sake of it, but making sure that it lines up to, you know, what we're trying to achieve every single day. And I think there is in restaurants, there's always that balance of that, you know, that sort of purpose driven uh, ethos of like why you're there, what you're trying to accomplish, but also because it is a product and it's a commodity that you have to sell. There's also that very baseline, like this is the product and it's like plates of food or it's yeah. in your case, you know, a slab of ribs or whatever yeah. that happens to be. You still have to talk about the product, even though that might not be the ultimate purpose. And there's a, there's a really fine balancing act that I think goes into how do we talk about both of those things? How do we like have a sales message inserted into our content? Um, but also, uh, you know, help us, our audience and our employees and partners understand that there is sort of a, a greater vision here too. Um, so that's one, I wouldn't say we struggle with it, but that's certainly one thing that's at top of mind, um, you know, when we're creating content or trying to put, you know, information out there. I mean, I think it's it's definitely a struggle for everyone. I mean, even including us, we're a barbecue media company and trying to figure yeah. out, you know, what is a piece of content that is a call to action. That's just an informational piece of content versus, yeah. you know, what we truly believe is storytelling and giving people access to things in our business, people in our business that they might not have access to the human side of, you know, the barbecue and the craft of barbecue. But uh, do you have technology is so important 
to everything yeah. that we do. And technology has revolutionized hospitality. It's it's literally given us the ability to do things that we've never dreamed of. I mean, we're transforming our business. You and I were talking before the show. Um, do you have yeah. any technology partners that you guys have leaned on heavily that um, you can share with our with our audience? I will tell you one thing that we we recently did that I think is is going to be a game changer is um, just from a, a a reservation standpoint a reservation booking platform uh, perspective is we recently uh, made the move from Talk uh, which is a nice platform um, it's certainly an interesting one when it comes to like what you can put on there in terms of experiences and product mix and just the way that you can engage the customer on Talk but. What we were finding was that the discovery aspect of talk just didn't rival um, that of Resi and OpenTable. And we, we were kind of looking around going like, OK, if we really want to drive revenue, if we really want to hit those revenue goals, is talk going to be the right partner for us? Um, we re recently just put all the restaurants onto OpenTable. And okay. I think some of the some of what they've um, uncovered and what particularly what they've done the last year or two during the pandemic, um, and I think by necessity is they really kind of focus on a, how they price the product. Um, and it used to be sort of like across the board, I think it was like a dollar reservation you paid open table for whatever got booked through the platform, you got charged a dollar for it as the restaurant tour. Um, but what they discovered during the pandemic was that that pricing didn't necessarily work financially for all restaurants. So they tweaked that so that things that are, um, like search for, or people, um, go into your website and book, those things are not charged for anymore. You're only charged if open table actually serves up, um, your restaurant in like an ad form and the, uh, the, the patron sees it and clicks through on it. So you get charged for that. Wow. And they've also, and so it's like made the financial burden on the restaurant less. Um, but it's also reinforced that open table is this like incredible source of discovery. Whereas like, I think the competitors that open table goes against just don't have that same amount of discovery. Um, like everyone has the open table app on their phone for the most part, right? If you mm -hmm. eat out, you generally have it on your phone because there's a restaurant somewhere along the line that's kind of forced you to download it. So you've got yeah. this wide, wide dearth of people who discover the discover restaurants on open table every single day. And what we've seen at least initially is just that it results in, hundreds and hundreds of more reservations per week even if you're paying for them like look the most expensive uh i think cost of customer on open table is like a dollar fifty it's like you couldn't run a facebook no. ad and, you, know, <laughs> you, know what I mean? you couldn't really yeah. run any digital media and yeah. have a have a customer acquisition cost of a dollar fifty so for me it's like cool <laughs> send them my, send them my way um so that's just from a booking and reservation standpoint i, I did like kind of a lot of research in the last three, four months in terms of like where to go with that. Cause I just wasn't seeing uh, the discovery aspect um, on it. And um, yeah, that's a really, that's a really nice one. Um, and then, you know, in terms of uh, other technologies, like we've, re we've recently engaged a specialist um, that came in and really revamped how we were running Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Nice. Uh, kind of just really looking at targeting, really looking at, all of the tools that exist in that tool belt. And there's so many of them. Like if you've ever spent any amount of time. It's unbelievable. Facebook, yeah. yeah. Like the Facebook ad platform is like, it's wild. How much, wild. You can do, how much you can target down to interest, down to geography. I mean, we were on it this morning and she was like walking me through what she was doing. And she's like literally building like these radiuses around each restaurant and then building retargeting lists and collecting, you know, thousands of emails per campaign. And then going back to those emails, like really like, and it, look, if you're an ad buyer, it's like it's sort of run of the mill stuff, but you know, restaurants, I don't think I've ever really delved as deep as they probably should have into I agree. that technology. And it's like I said, even if you're spending two, three, four or $5 on, you know, customer acquisition costs, if that person becomes a lifetime, you know, regular at your restaurant, like that customer's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Like yeah. it should be a lot more expensive to reach restaurant customers, but it's not. Hopefully Facebook's not listening to this conversation. <laughs> Probably someone is. <laughs> yeah. Amazon, you Facebook, Google, okay. somebody yeah. is. Yeah. Um, so one of the, as restaurant owners, we wouldn't be in this business if we didn't care about people. We spend all our lives taking care of people, taking care of our guests, yeah. taking care of our vendor partners, taking care of our, our team. Uh, 
very rarely do we take care of ourselves. Um, so the, there's people that are listening to this podcast that are, are restaurant owners or want to be restaurant owners. What, sure. what have you done to take care of yourself? Or what do you do to take care of yourself? Oh, man, um, I'm probably the the best person to ask that, to be honest with you. I do a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, deep into all things recovery, all the modalities around sleep, recovery. I mean, I'm into like exposure therapy. I'm into fasting. Um, I eat a really clean diet, no sugar. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. Um, I'm, you know, 40 years old and in probably the best shape of my life. Um, I just, I really kind of like five years ago decided that I just didn't want to be, you know, that person that was unhealthy and, and didn't want to, didn't want to have problems sleeping and wanted to age well. And like, just kind of made that cognitive decision in my life that I wanted to like live a certain way and really dove deep into, well, the first thing really that entered the rabbit hole for me was meditation and, uh, and breathing and just really kind of focusing on that. I learned how to do transcendental meditation or TM. And that's that amazing twice a day practice where like for 20 minutes, you know, in the morning and at night, you sort of get to escape and just like leave the world behind for a period of time and just enter this other zone. And if you go to any research around the benefits of meditation, it's like they're otherworldly in terms of, you know, brain cognitive performance, how it affects your sleep, stress levels, longevity, immune system, everything in your body is affected positively by having a mindfulness practice in your life every day. So um, that was definitely one thing that kind of started it all. And then as you get into it, you learn more about, okay, well, what are the nutritional and diet things that are important? And it's like, you start diving into that. It's like, okay, well, hydration is really, really important. Like you got to be drinking a gallon of water a day if you can, you know, if your body can can withstand that. And if you can get your body into the habit of drinking, you know, four, four liters of water a day, it's a lot of water. Uh, it's a lot of water. And you, you know, there's weird things like you got to go to the bathroom every five <laughs> minutes and like, but you learn to deal with it because you, yeah. at the end of the day, you feel energized, you feel great, you look better and it decreases the uh, amount of time you feel hungry. Like there's just so many aspects to it. And you know, all, all of these things, like, there's so many things that you could do and put into a protocol, but what I've tried to do just, pull it back into the conversation is I've tried to impart that into my employee base as much as I can. So people that work with me, the one thing that we do is like, we really focus on hydration. So if you work here, you get a personalized water bottle, like mine's right here. And you, uh, you yeah, you get a water bottle. It's uh, three quarters of a liter. So basically if you drink six of those in a day, you're pretty close to where you got to be. Um, but I mean, to be honest with you, like line cooks or, you know, people that come in and join this team, like they've never really even thought about that before in their own life. And you start to introduce little, like little like tricks and tips like that. Like, Hey, if you drink three or four liters of water a day, you're, you're going to feel really good. And it's, um, it's something that we try to really push and just reinforce every day. Obviously in a restaurant environment, it's very busy, but if we can keep people at the very least hydrated properly while they're in a very busy, stressful environment where you are, going to become dehydrated by nature of the job. Like if we can do that one thing and get that one habit installed into our employee bases, you know, like I said, tips and tricks. I mean, it does wonders for people. And I hear it every day, like people come up to me, and say, it. it's just this hydration tip. And like we can, we, we have plans on going further down that rabbit hole. We've done things like company yoga before where the whole company gets together once a week. Um, we haven't really been able to do that in the last year, just because of uh, everything that's been going on in the world. But as things lighten up here in the next few months, we'll get back to that. Um, even things like family meal, which we do every day at each one of the restaurants, we've been talking a lot more about how to make that food like more nutrient dense, um, how we make, you know, how we make those things balance out over the course of the week. Cause as you know, a lot of like, when you do family meal, a lot of, a lot of the times um, employees of yours who were having family meal with you, that's their one big meal of the day. Right. Yep. And we have the ability as the, uh, as the employer really impact their health, like through that meal. So just talking to chefs about how we make that as nutritious as possible and how we make that as enjoyable as possible, just things like that. Yeah. And obviously encouraging people to, to read and educate themselves on sleep. I think that's the other huge one is like, how do you dial in? Um, how do you dial sleep in? How do you give people like the best information around um, about sleeping well? Cause it's like, look, if we can feed people properly, the opportunity every single day that we get them, if we can, you know, give them enough water every single day that they are well hydrated, 
and we can teach them when they're not here how to sleep properly. Okay, like those three things at the least get done. I mean, you're talking about someone improving their performance Huge. every single day and probably feeling a hell of a lot better than they did before. So those are the kind of the three things we focus on from a, a wellness. I personally, to answer your question, go way further. I'm a bit <laughs> obsessed with it. And I do like, no, I, I was in cryo yesterday and doing like red go. light therapy and all the things, but. Well, you, you've, I, mo- you've motivated me. I'm oh, 40, you, I'm 42 and I definitely could drink more water and sleep better. Yeah, well, um, we, were, we were talking about it last time. I think you were, we were talking about just getting up early and how like yep. as you get older, like just putting that in is one of the most important it's things. It's the best thing do. you can do. Yeah. yeah, by far. Uh, what's your favorite digital playground so that people uh, who are inspired can reach out to you or reach out to uh, the restaurants that you guys are a part of? Um, you can go to CaminoIndustries.com. Um, okay. That's a good starting point. And then it'll kick you over to anywhere you want to go from there. But uh, cool. yeah, start at CaminoIndustries.com. Um, you'll find us. And then yeah, there's a lot of information there around who's on the team and what we're trying to accomplish. And, and then it'll kick you down. If you have interest in seeing the restaurants, it'll kick you down from there. Awesome. Well, yeah, if you guys want to reach out to me, it's at Sean P. Walchef. Uh, you can email me, Sean, at calibbq.media. If you know any restaurant influencers that are anywhere on the globe um, that are doing something that is inspirational that you think we should be telling their story, reach out and let us know. Uh, Philip Camino, honored to call you a friend. Uh, you're an inspiration, man. I love what you're building. Um, it's only going only gonna to get be- bigger and better. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to share your secrets. As always, stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. We'll catch you guys next week.